Hello, thank you for joining me today. I am Dr. Ricardo Kotleroff. In this video, we will talk about age-related macular degeneration, the risk factors, types of macular degeneration, different signs and symptoms, treatment, and other essential tips related to macular degeneration. Some medical conditions are highly feared by most people, such as being diagnosed with cancer or suffering cardiovascular accidents, having a heart attack, or having a stroke, but none are as feared as blindness and the loss of vision. First, before we proceed, let us understand what age-related macular degeneration means. Your ability to read is determined by how healthy the macula is as well as your ability to recognize faces, watch television, drive, use a computer, and carry out other visual tasks requiring us to see properly and correctly. Age-related macular degeneration causes the deterioration of the macula, which is the small central area of the retina that controls the acuity of visuals and causes vision loss affecting the quality of life. Age macular degeneration is the most common cause of irreversible central loss of vision in elderly patients. In the United States alone, macular degeneration afflicts almost 10 million individuals, twice the number of Alzheimer's disease patients, and roughly equal to the total number of all cancer patients together. Macular degeneration is the third largest cause of vision loss in the whole world. The problem is expected to deteriorate as the population grows old, and no effective treatment is available at the moment for the majority of affected patients. Macular degeneration is multifactorial disease. It's caused by the sum of the interaction of many genes and non-genetic factors. This leads to the development of a process that, among others, causes local inflammation, deposition of substances rich in lipids, and the neurodegeneration of the macula. If doctors detect macular degeneration in the first stages of the disease, it can be managed and treated. In macular degeneration, anatomical structures that allow vision are damaged. To understand the disease and its influence on our quality of life, let's view a small description of the anatomical structures involved and the process that allows vision and knowledge of the reality that surrounds us. In our central nervous system, there is an area called the visual system. The eye, the optic nerve, and the brain are part of the visual system. Vision is the ability to interpret light waves from the sun and are in the visible spectrum for us, or between violet light, 400 nanometers, to red light, 800 nanometers, a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. These waves of light are absorbed by objects, such as a tree, a person, or a flower, and reflect back to our eyes. In the anterior part of the eye is the cornea, constituted by a transparent tissue that protects and covers the anterior chamber, the iris, and the pupil, and allows the passage of light to the inner part of our eye. The cornea has a tremendous refractory power and is responsible for two-thirds of the power of refraction of the eye. The light continues to the lens, which focuses it on the retina in a dynamic way. This ability, depending on the distance of the object we're looking at, allows far and near vision. The retina is a light-sensitive membrane at the back of the eye. In the retina, the process of vision starts when the lens and the cornea of the eye concentrate light from the environment onto this light-sensitive membrane at the back of the eye. The process of sight starts when light meets your retina. The retina is formed by neurons interconnected by synapses that shape the sensory system of the ocular organ. There are three different organized layers of cell, which are the photoreceptor layer, the ganglion cell layer, and the bipolar cell layer. The photoreceptor layer is at the extreme back and contains two types of cells that are light sensitive. They are the 120 million cone photoreceptors and the 6.5 million rod photoreceptors. The cone photoreceptors are responsible for color perception. There are three different cone photoreceptor cells, red, blue, and green. The other type, which are the rod photoreceptors, allows the perception of objects in low light and produces black and white vision. 
Photoreceptor cells are a specialized type of cell capable of visual phototransduction. In the field of cell biology, signal transduction is defined as the process by which a cell, in this case a photoreceptor, converts a specific external signal or stimulus into another signal or specific response. The retina is an isolated part of the brain that serves as a transducer to convert light into neuronal signals. Let me explain the concept of transduction. Transduction is the channel through which energy from stimuli of an environment is changed to neural activity so the brain will comprehend and process. One biological benefit of photoreceptors is they convert or change light, which is visible electromagnetic radiation, into signals that stimulate biological processes. More specifically, the photoreceptor proteins in these cells absorb photons, causing a change in the potential of the cell membrane. The image is then transduced into electrical pulses. These pulses are carried by the optic nerve through the optical canal. On reaching the optic chiasm, nerve fibers decussate. The left will become the right. The fibers then divide into different places in the brain like the thalamus, the superior colliculus, and parts of the cerebral cortex. Processing of visual information is quite complicated compared to other special senses. Vision processing in the brain is not limited to a particular area. Instead, it follows a global circuitry involving multiple regions. The visual system in synthesis is a part of the central nervous system centered on giving organisms the ability to process visual detail and enables the formation of many non-image photoresponse features. It detects and interprets information from visible light to build a representation of the environment. This visual system carries out tasks that are complicated, including the formation of monocular representations and reception of light the identification and categorization of visual objects, the buildup of a nuclear binocular perception from a pair of two-dimensional projections, and guiding body movements in relation to the objects seen and assessing distances to and between objects. The psychological process of visual information is called visual perception. In the retina is a yellow area of only five millimeters in diameter, the macula which specializes in controlling the acuity of visuals, such as your ability to read, recognize faces, watch television, drive, and use a computer. This zone has differences with the rest of the retina as a large density of photosensitive cells of the cone type, 140,000 cones per square millimeter, and without rod type photosensitive cells. It also has a smaller thickness and a higher content of lutein and zeaxanthin, which are xanthophyll pigments that protect the macula against phototrauma. Another difference is that the pigmentary epithelium is denser than the rest of the retina. The retinal pigment epithelium, or RPE, is the pigmented cell layer right outside the neurosensory retina. It has no neurons, but cubic cells with melanin granules give it its pigmentary aspect. Its principal function is to nourish the visual cells and is strongly attached by the Bruch's membrane to the underlying choroid. The retinal pigment epithelium, or RPE, have important functions. Here are two of them. Form the blood retina barrier that controls fluid flow and nutrients entering the retina and prevents harmful substances from entering and damaging the retina. Absorb scattered light. Light is electromagnetic radiation and, when it is concentrated, causes a significant amount of photo-oxidative energy that can damage the macula. Absorbing the scattered light leads to a decrease in the photo-oxidative stress. The absorption of scattered light also improves the function and quality of vision. The last anatomical structure involved in macular degeneration is the choroid the highly vascular tunic of the eye between the retina and sclera. Its primary function is to nourish the retina, providing oxygen and nutrients and removing waste products. Age-related macular degeneration includes a broad spectrum of clinical and pathological findings that can be classified into two groups. Dry, also known as atrophic or non-exudative, 
all macular degeneration begins in the dry form. About 85% of people with macular degeneration only have the dry form. It's the most common and the least severe, and it will develop more slowly. Wet, also known as neovascular or exudative, wet macular degeneration happens in about 15% of people. Although both types are progressive and usually bilateral, they differ in manifestations, prognosis, and management. The precursor of macular degeneration is age-related maculopathy, of which the hallmark is the development of retinal drusen that, while not the cause, increases the risk of macular degeneration. As in the rest of the body's organs, older people will have changes in the eyes related to aging. Among these changes, we find arteriosclerosis in the blood vessels of the choroidal region. Arteriosclerosis is a vascular alteration where the arteries harden, lose elasticity, and increase in thickness. The pigment epithelium of the retina and its basal lamina called Bruch's membrane are the barriers that maintain the integrity between the choroid and the retina and allow the flow of chemicals to photoreceptors and the disposal of waste products. With age, there is an accumulation of fats, like lipofusin, in the retinal pigment epithelium, typically visible as dark pinpoint areas. This accumulation of fats can trigger processes that lead to the death of the pigmented cells. We must remember that the retinal pigment epithelium plays a vital role in keeping the cones and rods healthy and functioning correctly. We can also see a thickening in the Bruch's membrane that hinders the entry of nutrients and the exit of catabolites, or waste products, between the retina and the choroid region. As the disease progresses, more lipofusin accumulates in the pigment cells of the retina, and a significant increase in the thickness of the Bruch membrane is observed, leading these two processes to a higher accumulation of catabolites, or waste products, and an increase in the number of drusen, which begins to affect the central vision. There are different types of drusen. When there are few waste products, the drusen forms small white dots that do not affect the vision. The compilation of more catabolites or waste products from the cones and rods leads to larger, hard drusen that have well-defined edges and appear ophthalmoscopically as discrete yellow deposits, usually in the macular region. A more serious form is when soft drusen appear. They look like large white spots, are confluent, paler, less distinct, and lead to a thinner retina called geographic atrophy. It's associated with the development of exudative age-related macular degeneration. If we analyze the composition of the drusen, we found an accumulation of lipoproteins and lipids, complement, inflammatory proteins and amyloids, among others. As the disease progresses, we see the appearance of atrophic degeneration with severe thinning of the retina, death of cells in the retinal pigmentum epithelium, severe thickening of the Bruch's membrane, and arteriosclerosis of the choriocapillaris. One-third of wet macular degeneration patients present geographic atrophy. Wet macular degeneration happens when new abnormal blood vessels develop under the retina in a process called choroidal neovascularization, that is, the formation of a new abnormal vessel. How does this happen? In response to the damage caused by macular degeneration, the body tries to heal the retina and releases the vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, with the aim of activating the proliferation of new blood vessels that can improve the circulation to the retina's damaged area. So, in response to the vascular endothelial growth factor, the patient develops this abnormal growth of blood vessels called choroidal neovascularization. They will pass through the Bruch's membrane and grow toward the macula to improve the blood supply of the retina. Unfortunately, they are not healthy blood vessels. They are fragile and break easily, causing leakage of blood with the accumulation of proteins under the macula a process that, if left untreated, causes a flat or rounded scar under the macula, a rapid loss of vision, and considerable damage to photoreceptors. Furthermore, localized macular edema, or hemorrhage, may elevate a region of the macula or trigger a localized retinal pigmentum epithelium detachment. 
Signs and Symptoms In dry macular degeneration, the loss of central vision happens over years and is not painful. Many patients hold on to vision enough to drive and read. Straight lines are distorted and appear bent. Loss of visual acuity and sensitivity to contrast between objects is lost. In tasks where the distinction of fine details is essential, as in reading, handling, or face recognition, more light is needed, and in the opposite, the function tasks are more affected when the intensity of light decreases. Reading becomes blurred, and colors are less bright and intense. Scotoma, or central blind spots, usually happen late in the disease. The symptoms are normally bilateral. Changes in fundoscopic include the following. We can see changes in the retinal pigment epithelium, regions of chorioretinal atrophy, and drusen. Wet macular degeneration. In exudative degeneration, visual loss is of more rapid onset and greater severity, and the two eyes are frequently affected sequentially over a period of a few years. The exudative form accounts for about 90% of all cases of legal blindness due to this disorder. Quick vision loss, normally over days to weeks, is frequent in wet macular degeneration. Visual distortion is usually the first symptom, such as scotoma, which is a central blind spot, or metamorphopsia, which means curving of the straight lines. Shallow color and vision are not affected. However, the patient may legally become blind, less than 2200 vision, in the affected eye, especially if the macular degeneration is not treated. Wet macular degeneration normally affects one eye at a time. Hence, symptoms of wet macular degeneration are at times unilateral. Changes in fundoscopic include the following. LRE, or localized retinal elevation. Subretinal hemorrhage in or around the macula. Gray-green discoloration under the macula. Detachment of retinal pigment epithelium, which is visible as a region of retinal elevation. What is the mechanism of the detachment? impairment of the barrier function of Bruch's membrane between the retinal pigment epithelium and the choriocapillaris, which allows serous fluid or blood to leak into the retina to produce elevation of the retinal pigment epithelium from the Bruch's membrane. This causes the retinal pigment epithelium detachment or separation of the neurosensory retina from the retinal pigment epithelium and serous retinal detachment which leads to the formation of retinal edema and exudates in or around the macula. These changes may resolve spontaneously with variable visual outcomes, but are often associated with neovascularization arising from the choroidal vessels and extending between the retinal pigment epithelium and the Bruch's membrane. This subretinal neovascular membrane produces permanent visual loss. A sudden visual loss in patients with exudative age-related macular degeneration occurs at the time of pigment epithelial or sensory retinal detachment or hemorrhage from a subretinal neovascular membrane. All these changes may occur in previously undiagnosed patients, in patients known with atrophic changes, and other patients with exudative disease. The risk factors associated with macular degeneration are age, genetic variants, family history, smoking, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, obesity, previous cataract surgery, a diet low in omega-3 fatty acids, race or ethnicity, sex. As in all human experiences, some risk factors depend on us and we can eliminate them, like smoking and obesity. However, some do not depend on us and we can't change them, such as genetics and age. Let's take a look at each of the risk factors to increase our comprehension of how they influence the beginning and development of the disease. The most significant risk factor is age, the dominant cause of permanent, severe, irreversible loss of vision in people over the age of 60 is macular degeneration and disease prevalence for late macular degeneration is almost 10% in people over age 80. When genetic risk and environmental causes such as smoking or diet align with increasing age, the pathological changes of age-related macular degeneration becomes even likelier. Genetic variants. All organisms develop and reproduce thanks to a molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA. 
We call it the molecule of life since it contains the necessary instructions to make this process possible. DNA is transmitted from parents to children. DNA contains our genetic code and is found in the cell nucleus and the mitochondria of each cell of our organism, where it is organized into structures called chromosomes. The gen is the molecular information unit of genetic inheritance, and they occupy a fixed position in the chromosomes we call locus. The gen encodes a functional product, proteins, for example. The genome is the set of genes of species. We have between an estimated 20,000 and 25,000 genes, according to the Human Genome Project. In macular degeneration, the contribution support for genetics is incontrovertible, and it comes from both classical epidemiological and twin studies and gene mapping studies. Some basic concepts will help us understand the genetic errors in macular degeneration. The building blocks of human DNA are made up of four nucleotides. Their names are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Adenine always paired with thymine, A equals T, and guanine with cytosine, G equals C, as a key to its lock. Single nucleotide polymorphisms are the most common genetic error in macular degeneration. Errors are changes of a single nucleotide at a particular position in the DNA strand. For example, thymine instead of cytosine. That is, instead of the guanine paired to cytosine, G equals C, it pairs with thymine, G equals T. In our body, proteins have a central role in the normal function, structure, and regulation of all biological process. When we have a mutant gene, the protein coded by this gene is defective, and the set of processes that the protein controls is now pathological. These pathological processes lead to the development of macular degeneration. We also have polymorphisms in genes that encode defective proteins of the complement cascade pathway. Polymorphisms are in the genes that encode for defective proteins for high-density lipoproteins, extracellular matrix, and angiogenesis. For example, studies have demonstrated polymorphisms in genes that encode defective proteins of the complement cascade pathway, an essential biochemical process that helps or complements cells of the immune system to eliminate bacteria, viruses, and other invading pathogens. When microorganisms such as bacteria, viruses, or protozoa attack the organism, a defensive immune response occurs against the hostile agent. Part of this defensive response comprises a complement system formed by a set of molecules in the plasma that activate different biochemical cascades that will facilitate important processes such as the inflammatory response, phagocytosis, cell lysis, and apoptosis. Let's describe them. One, the inflammatory response occurs when the tissues of the body are attacked. Then the damaged cells release chemical substances such as prostaglandins, histamine, and bradykinin. As a result, there is an inflammation of the area due to the blood vessels spilling fluids to isolated substances or microorganisms from healthy tissues. 2. Phagocytosis is a process in which cells like neutrophils engulf microorganisms, cell debris, harmful particles, and eliminates them. 3. The cell lysis is the disintegration of a cell by a rupture of the cell wall or membrane which leads to its death, and apoptosis, which is a genetically determined process by means of which the DNA of a cell is damaged, and the fragmentation is activated, leading to the elimination and death of these pathological and unwanted cells. Other polymorphisms are in the genes that code for defective proteins for high-density lipoproteins or good cholesterol, whose function is to transport cholesterol. When they are abnormal, the bad cholesterol increases. There are also polymorphisms in genes that encode defective proteins for the extracellular matrix. The main protein of the extracellular matrix is the collagen. This and other molecules are secreted by specialized cells, creating an extracellular matrix that provides biochemical and structural support to surrounding cells. Polymorphisms are in genes that encode defective protein factors involved in angiogenesis the development of new blood vessels. 
These defective genes and proteins confer susceptibility to the development of macular degeneration. In the general population, the genetic risk is 23%, increasing to 45% in twins. Let's see some examples. After the pioneering discovery in 2005 of complement factor H, CFH, as a significant macular degeneration susceptibility gene, complex research identified 20 chromosomal regions as a harbor for genetic variants associated with macular degeneration. The gene for complement factor H is located on chromosome 1 in a region called Q31 and provides the coded instructions for the synthesis of the protein complement factor H. What is the complement factor H? The complement factor H is part of the complement system that consists of a number of small proteins found in the blood and is a part of the immune system that enhances and complements the ability of antibodies and phagocytic cells to clear microbes and damage cells from an organism, promote inflammation, and attack the pathogen's cell membrane. It is part of the innate immune system, also known as the nonspecific immune system or inborn immunity system. In synthesis, we summarize that the complement factor H prevents infection. It also attacks diseased dysplastic cells and spares cells that are healthy. Studies implicated activation of complement factor H in the formation of drusen, the hallmark lesion of macular degeneration. Recently, it was discovered that about 35% of individuals carry an at-risk single nucleotide polymorphism in one or both copies of their factor H gene. What does one or two copies mean? Humans have 46 chromosomes, 23 from the father and 23 from the mother. We also have two copies of each gene, one from the father and the other from the mother. Genes are responsible for our characteristics, for example, height, eye color, normal vision versus blindness to colors, etc. When the two genes, one from the father and the other from the mother, have the same information, we call them homozygous. When they have different information, they are called heterozygous. Homozygous individuals have an approximately seven-fold increased chance of developing age-related macular degeneration while heterozygotes have a two to three-fold increased likelihood of developing the disease. Other studies described a genetic risk factor related to changes in the long Q arm of chromosome 10 in a region called 10Q26. That change is also linked to a high risk of developing macular degeneration. The 10Q26 region has two focusing genes, ARMS2 equals age-related maculopathy susceptibility 2 that encode a mitochondrial protein especially associated with wet macular degeneration and the frequency of progression from dry to wet forms of the disease but are less associated with dry macular degeneration and the gen HTRA1 equals high temperature required factor A1 that is a major genetic risk factor for wet macular degeneration family history. Macular degeneration risk is increased by having unnatural or affected first-degree relative. Those who are at risk should be made aware of this and patients with macular degeneration should advise siblings and children to seek for proper ophthalmological advice in case they develop visual signs of distortion or decreased vision. Smoking. The association is unchanging across a range of studied populations applying different study types by various investigators. Though it depends on the type of macular degeneration, the risk of current smokers having the disease is two to three times the risk for never smokers. The popular opinion discovered that more than fourfold have a high risk of neovascular macular degeneration. A demonstration of dose response verified the risk of having macular degeneration doubles as the intensity of smoking increases. However, there was evidence that ex-smokers had a decreased risk of macular degeneration, suggesting reversibility of effect. Although the mechanism of action and the pathogenesis macular degeneration of smoking on the eye are not clear enough, the risk of having macular degeneration may involve more than one mechanism. First, you must know that macular degeneration reflects compiled oxidative damage in the retina 
Smoking may also lower choroidal flow of blood in the eye and promote ischemia, hypoxia, and microinfarctions, all of which may inflate the susceptibility of the macula to degenerative changes. The administration of nicotine had a high severity of experimental choroidal neovascularization in a mouse model. Smoking also has been revealed to lower macular pigment optical density, which projects the levels of the protective carotenoids, zeaxanthin and lutein in the macular retina. Some studies hypothesized a statistical interaction between smoking and 10Q26 genes, especially ARMS2, in the association with macular degeneration. Cardiovascular disease. Vascular disease and macular degeneration share related risk factors, such as high increased levels of cholesterol, triglyceride levels, and HDL cholesterol. Recent data postulates macular degeneration may independently predict coronary heart disease or stroke over the long term in persons aged between 49 and 75 years. Hypertension. The involvement of hypertension in the pathogenesis of macular degeneration has been well treated in literature since its first appearance. Hemodynamic abnormalities contribute to macular degeneration with a renin-angiotensin system playing a vital role. What is the renin-angiotensin system? The renin-angiotensin system is a hormone system that specializes in regulating fluid balance and blood pressure. Renin is an enzyme synthesized, stored, and secreted by the kidney cells. It has a role in regulating blood pressure by catalyzing the conversion of the plasma glycoprotein angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. This in turn is converted to angiotensin 2 by an enzyme present in relatively increased concentrations in the lung. Angiotensin 2 is one of the most effective vasoconstrictors known and it is also a potent stimulus of aldosterone secretion. Aldosterone makes the renal tubules double the reabsorption of sodium and water into the blood, while at the same time causing the excretion of potassium to maintain the balance of electrolytes. Many studies have shown that high blood pressure is associated with a reduced choroidal flow of blood and disturbed vascular homeostasis in these patients. Also, macular degeneration is surrounded by abnormal neovascularization, to which angiotensin II and growth factors make a big contribution. On the other hand, there is no data in the literature to back the view that successful management of hypertension and antihypertensive medication have a positive effect on the clinical outcome of macular degeneration. Obesity increases the risk of having late macular degeneration by 32 percent. The means by which macular degeneration is increased by obesity are linked to the physiologic changes occurring with this condition. These include increased oxidative stress, changes in the lipoprotein profile, and increased inflammation. Following is a brief explanation. Increased oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is a disturbance in the balance between the production of reactive oxygen species which are free radicals and antioxidant defenses. Where are the free radical produced? They're produced in the body by natural biological processes or may be introduced from an external source like tobacco smoke, toxins, or pollutants. And they can damage cells, DNA, and proteins by changing their chemical structure. In obesity, another physiologic change can occur in the lipoprotein profile that includes changes in the levels of total cholesterol, triglycerides, high-density lipoprotein, HDL, and low-density lipoprotein, LDL, cholesterol. These changes affect the macula negatively. The last thing obesity causes is increased inflammation. Inflammation is a rapid response mounted by the cell to a threat of imminent danger. Inflammation is intended to eliminate foreign or damaged material and to signal to other cells that there is a danger so that they can initiate a broader immune response. Inflammasome activation in the retinal pigment epithelium was reported for the first time in 2011. Inflammation is part of the process of disease development and the inflammasome is a complex of proteins found in cells 
of the innate immunity, the microphages and neutrophils. This protein complex has a fundamental role in the beginning and maintenance of some diseases since, when activated, they secrete a series of mediators that regulate other immune cells and the environment, determining the result of the immune response as good or bad for the patient. The physiologic changes described in obesity may lead to high destruction and a lowered circulatory delivery of zeaxanthin and lutein to the macula. Lutein and zeaxanthin are two major carotenoids found in the human macula and retina. They are the macula pigments and are five times more concentrated in the macula than in the peripheral retina. Among the functions of macula pigments is to protect the macula from absorbing blue light. Lutein and zeaxanthin may prevent eye disease because they absorb damaging blue light as it has an oxidative photo effect that damages the macula. Usually, the lens focuses all the colors in the same convergence point. There is a situation called chromatic aberration where there is a dispersion of colors. Lutein and zeaxanthin improve visual performance by reducing the effects of chromatic aberration. They improve visual performance by reducing the effects of light scatter. Obesity linked to macular degeneration risk may be via indirect effects on changes in zeaxanthin and lutein status and metabolism. Previous cataract surgery. There is growing sensitization of the effect of cataract surgery on pre-existing retinal pathology and the decision to carry out cataract surgery in eyes with a pre-existing retinal disease can, at times, be a Herculean task. The effect of cataract surgery on macular degeneration is more controversial, and the outcome of the different research is not consistent. Many epidemiological studies have come up with the suggestion that cataract surgery increases the progression of macular degeneration. A lot of this population-based research is, however, prevalence of result, and it is hard to know the difference between causation and association. The effect of cataract surgery on macular degeneration is more confusing when you look at early as opposed to late disease, and wet macular degeneration as opposed to dry macular degeneration, and consider the standards used to evaluate macular degeneration. Also, there is no consistency in the risk factors that can be statistically controlled. For example, the Beaver Dam Eye Study came up with a report linking early macular degeneration and cataract surgery. Freeman and colleagues discovered a connection between late macular degeneration II and cataract surgery. The Blue Mountains Eye Study could not find a link between either early or late macular degeneration and cataract surgery. And the Rotterdam Study saw a connection between early macular degeneration and cataract surgery but did not discover a relation with late macular degeneration. A diet low in omega-3 fatty acids. While there is not enough information and it is necessary to perform more randomized and prospective studies, there is a tendency to observe a protective effect of omega-3. Therefore, a diet rich in fatty acids and omega-3, such as Japanese food or incorporating fish, such as salmon, mackerel, sardines, prickly pear, and herring, into the diet may decrease the risk of developing macular degeneration. Race. Macular degeneration is usual among whites and affects individuals of European descent more rapidly than African Americans in the United States. Sex. Slight female predominance. Further study is required for other risk factors such as lifetime light exposure, estrogen replacement, and alcohol consumption. Regarding the diagnosis, we have many options. Fundoscopic examination, fluorescein angiography, color fundus photography, optical coherence tomography. Both forms of macular degeneration are diagnosed by fundoscopic examination. Visual changes can, at times, be detected with an Amsler grid. Your eye care physician may ask you to look at an Amsler grid. Changes in your central vision can trigger the lines in the grid to appear or disappear wavy. This is a sign of macular degeneration. Fluorescein angiography and color photography are done when findings postulate. By that I mean to suggest wet macular degeneration. In fluorescein angiography, which is performed by an ophthalmologist, 
a fluorescent dye is inserted into your arm. As the dye goes through the blood vessels in your eye, pictures are taken. This makes it easy to see blood vessels that are leaking, which occur in a complex, quick progressive type of macular degeneration. Uncommonly, complications can arise with the injection from nausea to more complex allergic reactions. Angiography characterizes and shows subretinal choroidal neovascular membranes and the areas of geographical atrophy can be delineated. You probably have heard of an ultrasound. It uses sound waves to capture images of living tissues. Optical coherence tomography, or OCT, is similar, except it uses light waves and can achieve very high resolution images of any tissues penetrable by light, like the eyes. After your eyes are enlarged or dilated, you'll be asked to place your head on a chin rest and hold still for some seconds while getting the images. The light beam is not painful. During the test, your eye care physician looks for drusen, which are usually yellow deposits under the retina. Many people have some very small drusen as a usual part of aging. Macular degeneration is indicated by the presence of medium to large drusen. Another sign of macular degeneration is the appearance of pigmentary changes under the retina. To add to the pigmented cells in the iris, colored part of the eye, there are pigmented cells under the retina. As these cells release a breakdown of pigment, your eye care physician may see a dark substance of released pigment, and later, regions that are not pigmented. Your eye color is not affected by these changes. OCT, optical coherence tomography, also helps identify subretinal and intraretinal fluid and can aid to assess response to treatment. Let me explain the treatment. Intravitreal antivascular endothelial growth factor drugs or laser treatments for wet macular degeneration. Dietary supplements for high-risk dry or unilateral wet macular degeneration. What are the supportive measures? Dry macular degeneration. Damage caused by dry macular degeneration is irreversible. Patients with pigment changes, extensive drusen, and or geographic atrophy can lower the risk of having advanced macular degeneration by 25% through the daily taking of the following supplements. Vitamin E, 400 international units. Zinc oxide, 80 milligrams. Copper, 2 milligrams. Lutein, 10 milligrams, zeaxanthin, 2 milligrams, or beta-carotene, 15 milligrams, or vitamin A, 28,000 international units for patients who have not smoked. Vitamin C, 500 milligrams. In current and ex-smokers, beta-carotene can inflate the danger of lung cancer. Recently, substitution of beta-carotene with lutein plus zeaxanthin has been discovered to have comparable efficacy. Therefore, such a change should be considered in both current and former smokers. Some patients taking beta-carotene also have yellowing of the skin. The zinc component of these supplements increases the risk of hospitalization for GU tract disorders. The studies on omega-3 fatty acids are non-conclusive. Some show that lowering cardiovascular dangers, as well as regularly eating foods high in omega-3 fatty acids and dark green leafy vegetables, may aid in reducing the progression of the disease. However, other recent trials have not revealed that taking supplements of omega-3 fatty acids will lower the progression of the disease. Moderate wine consumption may be protective as well. Wet macular degeneration. Patients who have unilateral wet macular degeneration can take the daily nutritional supplements recommended for dry macular degeneration to lower the danger of macular degeneration-induced vision loss in the other eye. The option of other treatments depends on the location, size, and type of neovascularization. Intravitreal insertion of antivascular endothelial growth factor medicines, such as ranibizumab, aflibercept, bevacizumab, or pegaptinib sodium, can substantially lower the danger of loss of vision and can help recover reading vision in up to one-third of patients. Photodynamic therapy, a type of laser treatment, also aids in some circumstances. Laser photocoagulation of subretinal neovascular membranes may delay the onset of permanent visual loss, but only when the membrane is far enough away from the fovea to permit such treatment. 
Although laser photocoagulation in patients involving the fovea improves the long-term prognosis for vision, the inevitable immediate reduction in vision from the laser treatment is often not acceptable to some patients. Studies have suggested that low-dose radiotherapy may produce regression of subretinal neovascular membrane. Corticosteroids, for example, triamcinolone, are sometimes inserted inocularly along with an antivascular endothelial growth factor drug. Other treatments, including subretinal surgery, transpupillary thermotherapy, and macular translocation surgery are rarely used. Patients often benefit from supportive measures. For patients without central vision, telescopic lenses, high-power reading glasses, low-vision devices like magnifiers, and large computer monitors are available. Some certain types of software can display computer data in large print or read information aloud in a synthetic voice. Low vision counseling is advised. It is important to reassure all patients that the disorder results in loss of central vision only. Peripheral fields and navigational vision are always maintained. Thank you for your time. If the knowledge provided in these videos enriched and formed the basis for the recovery of your joy, well-being, and quality of life, we have reached our humble goal. To help as many human beings in the fight against disease and in the recovery of health and life expectancy. This is the light and the force that guides us. Whoever saves a life saves the whole world. I present Miranda, part of our team, who will explain our treatment program for macular degeneration. See you soon, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ricardo Kotleroff, for your excellent explanations of this terrible disease that affects millions of people all over the world. When we began, Dr. Kotleroff was able to treat persons with diseases by using acupuncture, which had amazing results. However, there was a problem. Only those who lived close to the clinic at the time were able to be part of these fantastic treatments. Patients from all over began to hear of Dr. Kotleroff's success and wanted to experience these results themselves. They asked that more clinics be opened in other locations, but this unfortunately wasn't possible. So to solve this problem, Dr. Kotleroff began to develop homeopathy-based remedies that were based on acupuncture's principles and went on to make these treatments available worldwide. Since then, Premulife's remedies can help patients in any part of the world. These remedies can be ordered online and are then delivered right to the patient's home. Our treatment method allows us to prepare our remedy based on the diagnosis that we receive, which means that once you have been professionally diagnosed, you can then order our treatment based on the illness that you are diagnosed with. Now, I'd like to invite you personally to be part of Premulife's success and join all the thousands of patients worldwide who are already finding great improvement in their condition using our remedy. Our reason for doing this is very simple. When we cure someone and we see their relief and joy when they realize that their symptoms have been ended or slowed, we feel good inside. We feel proud satisfied and happy for them, genuinely happy. You may know this saying, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. Every person has a purpose in life, whether it's teaching, leading, or empowering. I believe that our purpose here at Premi Life is to help people get over their illnesses, letting them lead healthy, long, and comfortable lives. Premi Life wants to be your partner in managing your diseases. Since our founding in 1980, Premi Life has dedicated decades to helping patients throughout the world experience gradual improvement of diseases via homeopathy. Our homeopathic treatments are manufactured under strict quality guidelines for healthcare from the world's health organizations. Premi Life's unique homeopathic treatment is specifically designed and formulated to assist you in managing your disease. The different ingredients in each pill increase your likelihood of success. You can take our homeopathic medicine with any conventional medicine that you might be using. By ordering through Premi Life, 
you get consistently high quality homeopathic treatments based on the latest advancements in our field, natural remedies, unique and proprietary formulas, and direct hands-on experience treating patients the world over since 1980. Now that you understand what our treatments are and what they can do for you, I want to answer a common question. Is there any recommended time period for treatment? We strongly recommend that patients commit to a program of at least six months, although longer programs, 12 to 24 months, may even offer greater effectiveness. The duration patients participate in our program often will depend on the severity of the patient's illness and the improvements that are realized. Premi Life continually monitors each patient's progress and will optimize his or her treatment protocol as needed. If you are interested, I would like to ask you to click the button located under this video and join thousands of satisfied customers who are grateful each day for choosing the Premi Life treatment and have embarked on a new life. I will be very happy if you give us a chance to help you too. It's time to do something for yourself so you can do more and be more for the people and family you love. You deserve this and so do they. Let's get started right now. Don't let this become a secondary priority. Just click the Get Started button and you'll be on your way to enjoying a happier and healthier life. Click that button now and order the homeopathic treatment. If this video has enlightened you, don't forget to share it with your friends. I want to thank you viewers for taking your time to watch this video. I hope you enjoyed it.